My name is Ahmed, and welcome to Dustin Tribe. Since 2012, the original Muslim adventure community. This is our podcast, a production of the Outlanders Media Cooperative. We share reflections here, and we sometimes tell stories, and we invite you to learn more at www.dustintribe.com. My wife and I were recently discussing the Islamic institution of polygyny, the permission granted by God Most High, allowing Muslim men the option of marrying up to four wives simultaneously. We traded various scenarios, both historic and contemporary, where we felt the practice simply made sense. We're going to share some of that here, with a little bit of amateur psychology thrown in for your consideration and hopefully some expansion. Polygyny in our tradition has unfortunately accrued shades of the taboo. Now I have my personal suspicions, but we cannot say with conviction how this came to be, seeing as it was the practice of the noblest of men, our blessed prophet, may God's peace and blessings be upon him, and Although many Muslim luminaries after him also expanded their households through uh, the practice of polygyny, the institution has remarkably fallen into this state of disrepute. Now, there were abuses, of course, and abuse takes place most often in situations where there's a high degree of isolation. So there always will be abuses in general, but in particular, in any arrangement that sees fit to dismiss the balancing weight of social participation. We do not gather at weddings only to eat cake and catch bouquets. We are there first and foremost to act as witnesses. We are there to recognize and maintain the boundaries established by the contract. We are there to hold the married parties accountable to the agreements made in our presence. And in responding to the invitation, we are pledged to remain as advocates for the married parties as their relationship evolves. It's a lot of responsibility, and most of us aren't actually interested in doing anything other than eat cake. When problems arise in marriage, what we have witnessed most often is social withdrawal. The couple pulls away, not at all trusting that the larger Muslim community will be sympathetic to their difficulties. And This instinctive recoiling is mirrored by the community, which similarly pulls away in a bid perhaps to avoid taking sides. But the generation of factions is virtually inevitable as respective families rally behind their party and demonizing the other and sowing bitter seeds of enmity throughout their larger social circles. This is is what we do when we're hurt, and we don't have the presence of mind to understand that hurt, that pain, in the context of God's larger plan. But the bottom line, it doesn't have to be that way. Marital challenges invites conversation and communal problem solving. We all have a stake in promoting a good outcome where care and respect are maintained. Our shared investment is in the example such hopeful outcomes provide for future generations, those young people whose attitudes are largely framed by the actions of their elders. So arriving at a good outcome for the distressed couple must involve a consideration of all possibilities, including two that, although addressed and sanctioned by God himself, we collectively choose to ignore as honorable solutions, and that's divorce and polygyny. But the reality is is that most of us are not interested in solving problems. We're much more interested in maintaining illusions, and so we'll only ever consider options that we imagine will put us back in alignment with our daydreams, and we need to get over that. Because life for the Muslim is nothing but the perpetual shattering of illusions. Once we've identified that God is our sole aim and purpose, we've exposed ourselves to the certainty that this notion will be tested. Do the people reckon that they will be left to say, we believe, and will not be tried? That's from the Quran, 29th chapter, the second verse. And these trials, they show up for many of us as loss. Innocence, wealth, family, friends, 
spouses, our youth, beauty, health, identity, even our faith. And with the inevitability of our graves looming ever larger before us, how much sense does it actually make to invest in our illusions? We've got work to do, namely the work of affirming God's sovereignty through our actions. Anything that furthers this intent is absolutely a solution. If ending a marriage through divorce helps to maintain God's limits, then we do so, separating with kindness, as is his mandate. And similarly, if we've got a problem that the taking of more than one wife might solve, then we need to put that option on the table. And yeah, we've got a lot of problems. Let's be pragmatic. Population decline is the boogeyman that a majority of industrialized nations are currently contending with. Healthcare costs for an aging population is expected to completely outpace the gross domestic product of a shrinking labor force. And this is a recipe for social collapse, which is happening anyway. We've written a few times about the uh, MIT paper that came out in the 70s that projected total social collapse mm, somewhere in the neighborhood of 2040, thereabouts, uh, really just a function of uh, a capitalist ethos which predicates uh, success on unchecked economic growth. Well, you can't have a system that is designed for perpetual expansion in a finite world, which is, of course, the one that we live on. So if we really consider the opportunities that we have here, it's to bring children into the world at the point of collapse, such that in the restructuring of society post-collapse, you're dealing with survivors who are in their early 20s. These are effectively the foot soldiers of the new society. And I know that all sounds really weird and apocalyptic and whatnot, but there's a lot of documentation suggesting this is something that we need to be thinking about. Now, the fix most often kicked around is immigration. It's not the worst idea, but the energy and expense of bringing people in and socializing them and understanding that some part of their earned revenue is almost certainly going to be sent overseas renders that plan less than ideal. The industrialized world is enamored with technology, and we can all anticipate that an AI-powered workforce is being planned and built to head off the population crash. This is a terrible idea and already a source of existential nightmares for most sane people, but it's the kind of corner you back yourself into when you decide that the practice of polygyny is untenable. As with this uh, Muslim feminist paper published in collaboration with the United Nations and funded by the Swedes, which is also a country that's experiencing precipitous population decline, that uh, paper put out by an organization um, called Musawa. Uh, I don't know a lot about them, uh, but it's heartbreaking to say the least when you have Muslim-led organizations driving initiatives to uh, shut down uh, what are effectively Islamic institutions. And this is an institution which introduces a novel solution, more wives equals more opportunity for children. It's a pretty straightforward equation. And domestic abuse by men is another issue that we believe may be mitigated through the wider practice of polygynous marriage. Domestic abuse, we need to emphasize, can unfold at the hands of both men and women. Statistically, however, most of the incidents that we see do in fact proceed from men. In a healthy, public, and communally sanctioned version of the arrangement, the advocacy of sister wives and their extended families can act as an in-house check, protection, and shelter against a husband's physical, financial, emotional, and or sexual mistreatment. And there are also economic benefits to polygyny. Disparity is a huge buzzword, with taxation of the rich kicked around in politically progressive circles as some kind of great equalizer. And were it not for the interminable creativity of accountants to the uber-rich, it might actually be. But we can't forget the role that small ethical businesses and healthy marriages may play in the redistribution of wealth. Assuming an affluent husband 
Polygyny can be a means of distributing his wealth across several families while also incubating that wealth within his expanded household. Not all of his wives may be interested in or capable of birthing children, which allows for the possibility of multiple persons sharing in the responsibility of child care. This frees up time for everybody to pursue advanced education, certifications, and the establishment of one or more businesses. Sexual mismatches. That's a very real concern in traditional Muslim marriages that do not allow for premarital experimentation. And in many cases, time and open minds and compassionate communication can resolve these challenges admirably. We suggest that couples wait at least three years before having children for this reason. We need time to get to know each other. However, in those more intractable bedroom situations not amenable to improvement, divorce may be reasonably and honorably considered. And this is particularly true in situations where a woman's libido or inclinations cannot or will not be matched by her spouse. The opportunities for sexual expression in our tradition are limited, and if this is a priority for someone, then they need to be given every opportunity to explore this facet of themselves. Although sensitive, we cannot allow shame to creep into our assessment of these important dynamics, and if it is the husband whose needs are not sufficiently gratified, well then, in addition to the possibility of ending the relationship, we should include the option of domestic expansion. There are many women in our circles who are actualized through their careers, academic pursuits, and public work. They do not feel a strong domestic calling, although they appreciate companionship as much as anyone. For such individuals, a polygamous arrangement may offer just enough of what they need without becoming burdensome. Now, a plural marriage is not for everybody. Going back to the example of our prophet, may the peace and blessings of God be upon him, he remained monogamous with his first wife, Khadija, until the end of her days. May God be pleased with her. They were married for some 25 years, and she was the only woman with whom he had surviving children. And her death was a monumental loss for the messenger. May God's peace and blessings be upon him. We recognize his humanity even as we are awed at his rank and station, and we have witnessed many good women and men absolutely transformed by their grief. Realizations of life's impermanence takes hold. Priorities shift. Where we once chased butterflies and imagined that the adoring eyes of our beloved would be the only thing we could ever want or need, we now bristle at the naivete of it all. We now see the opportunities that go unrecognized and ignored, or else approached with shocking inefficiency. Whether we're building wealth and institutions, or we're strengthening social networks through more rigorous communal accountability, or we're trying to offset regional population decline through the siring and raising of responsible children with a profound sense of the sacred, plural marriage offers some promise for those of means who happen to be so inclined. Our dismissal of polygyny only robs such persons of an important domestic advantage that, in the current political climate, we are foolish to squander. I know men with both the resources and the inclination, and I have seen them driven into the shadows where they now keep their secret wives. They're altogether too concerned with public opinion, and so they allow themselves to be caught in a gross and unfortunate feedback loop, shamed into the underground by our collective pearl clutching. And once hidden, the entire enterprise becomes unseemly and dark, ripe for abuse and ridicule, and so the cycle continues. Until we break it. Now, we do not suggest that men should ever aspire to plural marriage, pursuing such an arrangement out of a, a sense of novelty or imagined status or pious emulation. That's a red flag that we hope will sufficiently minimize any prospects to the point of frustration. But we do want Muslims to feel good and to stand tall in the exercising of all the options that God has put before us. The world has many problems. And what are we? 
if not the solution. You can read a transcript of this recording, get on our mailing list, and learn about upcoming events at our website, www.dustandtribe.com. My name is Ahmed, and this is the Dust and Tribe Podcast.